Alexei Pankin is a, a Russian political and media analyst. Delighted to welcome him from Moscow. We've just been talking about uh, his distinguished career. He was telling me that, um, for those of you who know about these things, he began in Georgi Arbatov's institute in Moscow that studied the USA and Canada and was um, very influential in the perestroika years and went from there to work on international life, Mizunarodnia Zizna, a magazine which dealt with foreign policy and was also pivotal in the perestroika uh, movement. In fact, he was just telling me that he was interviewed for his job by Edward Shevardnadze, Gorbachev's foreign secretary, foreign minister, so you can tell it was sort of well part of that um, reform movement. Uh, he went on, he's been, uh, had a varied career. Um, in the mid-1990s, between 92 and 96, he was organizing national elections media coverage and monitoring missions for the European Commission and the OSCE in um, parts of the former Soviet Union from Estonia, including former Yugoslavia and the South Caucasus and Russia. And um, he was uh, a, f a, f um, a founder of the op-ed page on the leading Russian national daily is Vistia, and a sort of badge of honor. Um, uh, he worked on these pages doing the op-ed, and in 2005, when it was taken over by Gazprom, he was telling me he was sacked because he didn't want Gazprom to edit his columnists, so he decided to leave the paper. Um, in, the, in the middle of all that, between 1995 to 2004, he also ran his own paper called Sreda, which included Patrick Coburn, who many of you know as a weekly columnist. Monthly. <laughs> monthly, he was a monthly, monthly, monthly columnist, and worked for the Soros Foundation. And now uh, he is uh, a guest columnist for Moscow Times and RIA Novosti. So those are my two guests. The subject that we're going to be discussing, you've seen the title, Resurgent, Russia Resurgent, with a question mark. And uh, of course, in recent years, we've all come to recognize that there is a newly resurgent Russia, a country which 15 years ago was plagued by hyperinflation, with its economy in free fall, and 10 years ago, only 10 years ago, was in default. So an astonishing revival to see a country backed by increasing oil and gas revenues and a period of economic stability, paying off its debts early, seeking to modernize its military, <coughs> projecting a new assertiveness in foreign and economic policy, which some would say is using its clout to throw its weight around. All put into sharp focus by the conflict over Georgia this summer. Uh, where the Russians claim they came to the aid of the South Ossetians who were under threat from attack by the Georgians, but the Georgians say was a planned incursion and their military action was provoked. Either way, it's led to Russia recognizing two enclaves in Georgia, not just South Ossetia, but also Abkhazia as independent, although a few other countries have followed suit. And the Kremlin is the president, prime minister, are openly declaring that the Caucasus is a historical and current zone of interest for Russia, which it has a right to intervene in, and that it considered it its right to defend the interests of Russians wherever they are, including beyond Russia's borders. And uh, Moscow has made no secret of the fact that its um, intervention in the Caucasus this summer was also a message to NATO not to push ahead with expanding NATO membership to Georgia and Ukraine and therefore bringing uh, NATO right up to Russia's borders with Ukraine and the Caucasus. But that, as you probably all know, is not the way Russia sees it. It talks of NATO encirclement. It says it's tired of being ignored and sidelined in European security debates, like the NATO-Russia Council. And it insists that it's not manifesting an old Soviet imperial approach, but the reasonable interests of a large power concerned about the stability of its neighbors. And it wants a new security arrangement in Europe to include Russia and new rules, which sounds like the end of NATO domination. In other words, it wants respect. Um, but as we know, August is now history. Uh, September and October have been overtaken by global financial turmoil, which has possibly given the US and other European powers more urgent issues to focus on than tensions with Russia. And as we all know, it's also hit Russian markets too, down by 70%, two thirds of their value since May. As well as individual Russian oligarchs, many of you will have seen that Deripaska was on the front page of the Financial Times today. And the price of oil has fluctuated as well, at times down below the $70 a barrel mark, which it's estimated are needed for Russia to maintain its current economic ambitions. So the question is, where are relations between Russia and the West heading? Are we in for a period of dangerous new east-west tension? And is Russia a new threat 
which the West needs to find a u new united policy to counter? Or does it have a point when it claims there are Western double standards? And has have the financial uh, developments of the last two months meant that this whole uh, crisis has been cast in a different mould now because the world is shifting anyway on its axis. So a lot to talk about. I'm going to give the floor to Ed Lucas to give his view and then Alexei to reply. Um, we'll ask them questions, have a bit of a discussion and then throw it open to all of you to ask your questions or make your points briefly, of course. So, Ed. Well, Bridget, thanks very much indeed uh, for that. And I must say what I'm really looking forward to is lots of really hostile questions um, because I think that makes it both entertaining for everybody and also stimulating for me. So I just want to make three general preliminary points before we get on to the discussion. The first is that I think it's really important to distinguish between being anti-Kremlin and anti-Russian. I'm, the, people have said this is an anti-Russian book. It is absolutely not an anti-Russian book. So we'll do a little test. If I was to say Bonhoeffer, Brandt, Stauffenberg, Dietrich and Heim, you probably have a pretty good idea that I was talking about famous Germans who, in one way or another, were involved in the resistance to Hitler. And you can go to little towns in Germany and you will find streets named after them. And that's as it should be. So I can do a little test. I'm going to name four names. Can anybody name the other four? Feinberg, Litvinov, Gorbanevskaya, Dremluga. Hands up. Very good. We see it. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> That's as it should be. Um, these are just four of the eight people who really invented the modern human rights movement. Because 40 years ago this August, they demonstrated on Red Square against the Soviet-led invasion of Czechoslovakia. And they're part of a tradition which has been wiped out by the Czechisti, the ex-KGB people, who are in the Kremlin. Quite interesting, people try to replicate their demonstration this August on Red Square, and yet again, under the same slogan, Zavasho i Nasha Svobodo, for your freedom and ours, and yet again, the police came and took them away, this time not to Labour Camp and Psychiatric Hospital, thankfully, because things have changed, but it was extraordinary to me that there is not even a plaque on Red Square to mark those people who stood up to communism in, in such incredible bravery. It's almost unimaginable sitting here in London. And part of a tradition that goes back via Akhmatova and Gertsen and Mandelstams and many other people, some of whom whose names sadly we don't know because they died anonymous in the Gulag. And we must not let this regime in the Kremlin make us think that in order to be pro-Russian, you have to be pro-imperialism and pro-authoritarianism. Those two malevolent tendencies, which I would argue have hijacked the idea of Russianness. So I'm absolutely not anti-Russian, and the book is not anti-Russian. I think that 1991 was a liberation for Russia, just as it was a liberation for the other captive nations of Eastern Europe, from a regime which killed more Russians than anybody, than they kill people of any other nationality. And one of the things I find most extraordinary about this regime is the way it has managed to combine the colours of red, brown and white. So you have the Orthodox Church being elevated to a state church inside the Kremlin, and outside you still have Lenin's body um, unburied in the mausoleum when it was Lenin who launched the Red Terror which really ripped up the Orthodox Church at, it, at its root. And secondly, this is not a book which maintains the West has a moral high ground. Most of the really severe criticisms in this book are against the West and some of the even more severe ones are the ones that I couldn't print because the libel lawyer wouldn't let me print them. And when you read the book, you may find every now and again a phrase such as so-and-so vehemently denies all wrongdoing. And when you read that, um, or so-and-so strenuously protests his innocence, and when you read that, I'd just like you to make a, a not on every occasion, because that would be probably incurring yet more um, problems with the libel lawyers, but there are occasions on which you might want to substitute in your mind, instead of vehemently protest his innocence and strenuously denies all wrongdoing, the phrase has no convincing explanation for his conduct. Because I think that pretty much applies to the people who, not just in politics, but also in the world of accountancy and of banking, have betrayed the principles on which the West stands. Because I'm arguing really strongly that we are, we are guilty for allowing these ex-KGB people to exploit the weaknesses in our system. It's only thanks to us 
that they are able to take their stealing machines, machines which have looted tens of billions of dollars, chiefly from the people of Russia, through these scams in oil and gas. It is we who have allowed these stealing machines to launder that money through our banks. It is our accountants who say sign off on the books. It is our lawyers who make it look legal. And it's in some cases our capital markets which allow these stealing machines, which sometimes have stolen not only billions of dollars from the Russian people, but billions of dollars in Western shareholders' money, and allowed them to list their shares and sell their bonds on our stock exchange. Finally, I wish we didn't start from here. I wish we could have the 1990s over again. I wish we had not lost the moral high ground in the 1990s when we sold the past again and again and again, allowed rigged elections, um, turned a blind eye to rigged elections, turned a blind eye to the shelling of the Russian uh, parliament and so on and so forth. But we start where we are. And I think we have to do two things. We have to defend our allies and we have to defend ourselves. And there's a little French proverb which says this animal is very naughty. When it's attacked, it defends itself. And sometimes I get a little whiff of that when I see some of the criticism that are levelled against us. How dare we? How dare we be so provocative as to try and think that maybe we need to make some contingency plans to defend the Baltic states, our allies in NATO? Even the idea that at the moment there are no contingency plans because Russia, according to NATO, is not a threat. And when NATO members say, well, actually, just in cases, there are actually only 25 anti-tank missiles in the entire Baltic states. Just in case, maybe it would be a good idea if we were to make some contingency plans. So just in the extremely unlikely event that we saw maybe not this regime, but a future regime in Russia intervening to protect its compatriots in the Baltic states the way it intervened to, com to, to, to protect its compatriots in South Ossetia. Just in that unlikely eventuality, it might be a good idea to have some contingency plans. And we get major NATO countries saying, no, we cannot do that because that is too provocative. That's where we've got to. I wish we didn't start from here. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. Alexei. Well, uh, I think that... Edward made a <clears throat> well. First of all, I'm, perhaps I must apologize for for not writing books because it's never too late. Because life in Russia is actually so exciting and and, and eventful that that wasting several months of, of my life sort of shutting out for producing another thick volume is I think it's really a waste of my life. Well, I have to thank I have to thank Ed for making a perfect uh, perfect communist message because what he said on the oligarchs laundering money in the UK for instance and supporting their football is the message that only communists are making now in Russia uh, and that's actually what keeps this particular situation that he describes is that something that keeps the communism alive because by the end of the Soviet Union the communism was really dead and then it was really the atrocities of the people who self-appointed themselves as Democrats that, that revived it and uh, at some stages made it uh, into a real danger. But still, I'm really happy for the, for the priest in this case because I suppose now your soccer or football is thriving on, on Russian money. So perhaps sitting here in London, I won't be so harsh on the oligarchs. I would also like to... to probably say a good word about the deceased communism because communism, the Gorbachev communism is basically compared to the Stalin communism as let's say Pope John Paul II compares to the great inquisitor. Basically it was on the decision of the communist party of the USSR that the free elections were introduced in Russia, that market economy was introduced uh, in Russia, it was the Communist Party headed by Gorbachev, actually, which started the process of negotiation or renegotiation of the Union Treaty, which was to uh, do the ensure the transition of the Soviet Union into something very different in a peaceful manner, not just in the manner it was done by the nationalists. And the main tragedy, I would say, about the collapse of the Soviet Union, I would say, is that the idea of civic society was replaced in the national republics by the idea of the ethnic states. And that's where the sort of current problems in, in Georgia uh, really comes from. So, and basically having done that, having, having done 
uh, introduced free elections and market economy. Communism had safely committed suicide. So I would not really carry around corpses of somebody who sort of took his life away around. So I don't really bother about, about Lenin lying in the mausoleum. And as a member of the Andrei Sakharov uh, Award for Journalism in Russia, I don't really sort of suffer too much that the names of those heroes are not anywhere because there are lots of places where they are memorized in Russia, including the Andrei Sakharov Museum where our jury gets together. As far as the topic is concerned, I suppose that we are speaking about two very different issues. First, there is a situation in the Caucasus, this recent war, which is a case in itself. And this particular case, uh, which was uh, basically, I think, well, some people in Russia, people argue whether we were just taken into by surprise by Saakashvili's uh, sort of improvisation, or that was a big trap in which Russia fell because it, it just could, it couldn't fail to, re, to, 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 to repel this, this uh, attack on, the, on its peacekeepers and the Ossetian people who are not only many of them are Russian citizens, but for them Russia is and was and has been for the last 17 years as the only guarantor from uh, the need to stay uh, with Georgia. So this is, a, this is a really very, very special case, and I think that there's more acrimony and, 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 and emotion and impulse even on the, uh, on the, in the actions of our leaders than there is a cal cal calculation and any kind of, 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 of thinking. Then there is a, uh, another story about whether Russia is resurgent or not, and uh, I, won't, I can't give it to it a simple answer. It is both resurgent, it is both not resurgent, it is also behest by a lot of uh, domestic uh, problems. And uh, so I think this, this requires a more detailed discussion, so I would leave this probably to questions. Um, Can I come back on a couple of those? Yeah, do go back. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I find it, I mean, I've been accused of a lot of things in my time, but I, I think this is honestly the first time I've been accused of having communist sympathies. This is really a, a first, and I shall remember that forever, so thank you. But, I, and, and I, I, I did not accuse you. No, but I mean, I mean you say <laughs> only... It was only, a statement of only, fact. If you say only, I mean, it is, it, is, it is not true. It is not true that only the communists attacked the oligarchs. I was reading New Times the other day, Eugenia Albert's paper, there was a very interesting attack on um, certain, certain oligarchs there. I mean, I, I think that the whole phrase oligarchs may be heading into history. I think they're becoming minigarchs or even nanogarchs now as their fortunes <laughs> collapse. But certainly we have, you know, we, st we will still have very powerful tycoons um, who's um, you know, run big companies on behalf of the Kremlin, but I think possibly the days of the um, old-style oligarchs may be shrinking. But the, the real point is, I, f I find it outrageous <coughs> that it's acceptable to steal money in Russia and use it to buy political influence in Britain. This seems to me to be um, a bad thing both for Russia and for Britain. And it's one of the fundamental points I'm trying to make in the book, is that if we think in our system, that only money matters, then we're defenseless when people attack us using money. And that is pretty much what's been going on over the last few years. Now, it's difficult to name names in a, in a, in a broadcast, um, in, in, a, in a broad environment that's being broadcast, but it must be a cause of some alarm, I think, to see the way in which prominent West European politicians, particularly former politicians, are queuing up to accept 30 silver rubles from Gazprom um, sometimes in connection with um, energy projects which have been approved during periods when they were actually in government in the country's concerns, but it no more explicitly than that. And so I'm not getting on a moral high horse and saying the oligarchs are uniquely bad. We have um, plenty to be cross about on our side. Now, but I want to come, I think a really important point you made, when you said communism committed suicide, well maybe it did or maybe it just asphy asphyxiated, but I think the really important thing is the KGB didn't. And it seems to me what's really happened is that these, the, the Czechisti, these ex-KGB, 
realized a few very important things in the 1980s. Possibly they realized them as, in, as early as the Andropov era. They realized that communism didn't work. They realized that totalitarian systems are inherently brittle. And they realized that maintaining an empire by force of arms is very expensive and leads to all sorts of unpredictable consequences. So it seems to me that the, what you've got now is you've got the KGB, the form of people like Sechin, Ivanov, Putin and, and the others, who are running Russia, and they dumped communism in favor of their version of crony capitalism. Uh, they've dumped totalitarian control in favor of a kind of repressive tolerance, where you have 80% control. You control the broadcast media, but you allow the print media, the Moscow Times or whatever, or the internet, to have quite a lot of freedom. And instead of trying to maintain a military empire in the old, old um, Soviet, uh, in the, in the old Soviet, uh, Soviet bloc, you use um, soft power. You use energy, you use to some extent propaganda, and you use, of course, um, the, uh, um, the, your, your, your financial pressure, as we're seeing in, in, in some countries. Um, you mentioned the Sakharov Center. I mean, I think the Sakharov Center is wonderful. Let's not forget it's under legal onslaught at the moment for having had a, an art exhibition which didn't fit the Kremlin's definition of what was right or proper in that. So, although I'm delighted it's still there, every time I look at the Russian internet, I'm afraid that uh, I'm going to see that there's been another raid or something. Not to bother. Um, I just, let's just pick up a couple of things that Ed Lucas raised there. Control of the media, Alexei, you're a um, columnist working in Russia. So, enlighten us, how much control is there? Well, I would say that, that all three, uh, well, ma major, uh, ma major, at least, let's say, major television networks are controlled. And uh, that's for sure, and that's. Uh, and now I think uh, we are coming to a realization, and it, uh, even people over there come to a realization that it, it's simply dysfunctional, because there are, uh, let's say, research and reports that show that people simply run away from, from news. The educated, uh, the educated, yeah, it's, it's still television. The pe pe people sort of, uh, let's say, common people, they still, yes, take their news from, from uh, from uh, from television, from television news, but the bulk of the educated, active, and uh, independently think, uh, thinking people are now being lost to television, and that's a big problem, which even the the um, our authorities understand. Because for all that, for for I mean I mean I make I, I, can, I can make even worse picture, produce a worse picture than than Edward does. But still, I mean, for, for all that, there's still a more or less modernizing force in Russia, whatever we, we think about them, and they need this type of audience. So now I think from what I can watch, there's some kind of internal debate about how to make television more receptive to, to, to this type of, of, of people. And uh, so there is both control and control which is completely inefficient. The internet is even even counterproductive, and this understanding is sort of uh, penetrating. I think the heads of our political leaders. Then the internet is spreading, spreading almost like fire. And there's no. There are some cases that that this or that uh, site is being closed, or I even saw a wonderful uh, court decision to confiscate the websites. <laughs> but that gives you an idea of, of uh, simply how unsophisticated people who are doing with it. So there are cases of censorship, but they are irrelevant given the huge number of, of sites and freedom on the internet, etc. The papers are relatively free, and why I never, for instance, when I when I was sacked from Izvesti, why I never made fuss about that? Because Izvesti is a sort of completely money losing newspaper. And when the paper is money losing, you 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 can't uh, really uh, sort of you know uh, complain or protect the, the the new owner whatever he wants he he, he does that uh, with the paper. Self-sufficient newspapers that, that operate as um, as uh, proper businesses, they and there are such papers. I, I would give you the same Moscow Times, the other Misty, which is a joint project between uh, the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, Commerçant, uh, some other papers, they're really, uh, they're under no threats. They're free to choose the political affiliation. For instance, one of the Russia's mostly successful papers and mostly um, 
uh, high circulation papers printing, I think, something like 3 million copies of a weekend edition. It, it did choose to be pro-Putin, but it's more or less its own choice, right? Then we have Moskovsky Komsomolis, which is different. We have, again, very critical commerce. So in the newspaper sector, there's a huge diver diversity of, of views. And what is more important for the future of, of this sector is that it is very uh, quickly mastering the publishing techniques. Unfortunately, in the preceding period, the, uh, the, 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 I mean, before Putin came to power, actually, the media was not viewed as any kind of business. It was viewed as propaganda organs of various types of the same oligarchs who basically subsidized the media, be it television or radio or newspapers, for the sake of extracting money from the state. Now, since Putin has abolished, let's say, stopped taxing advertising, which, which was the case before, really the pro professional media began to grow very quickly. And so still there are lots of cases of censorship, stupidities, etc., etc. But I think that the base for the free press is on the independent press is, has been laid in the last eight, or probably not eight, but five to six years, where Russian, I say, media people, professionals felt that, that they are they are the ones who are doing professional, professional job, not just sort of self-expressing the ideas which nobody cares about, but somebody pays, pays uh, luxuriously. That's the thing. And I'm telling this, and this is my favorite subject, because among other things, I'm editing a magazine which is an international ver version of the <coughs> IFRA magazine, which is a magazine for the Russian version of international of IFRA magazine, which is a uh, monthly magazine for business, uh, for media business executives. So this situation not quite well. And mm -hmm. although I say I am a victim of the regime, I am among the most, still remain among the most optimistic people Tell about us, the you, future of the media. As a guest columnist, do you, are there subjects where you metaphorically look over your shoulder think, no, mm, no, but never. not write about that? No, never. I, and I must tell you that, that uh, again, uh, if, 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 if personal stories uh, of, of any interest, when I was sacked from, from Izvestia, my colleagues, and basically have no other jobs than, than some odd jobs or contracts, etc., when my colleagues began from Ria Novosti, began inviting me to, to write for them, I was telling them, I'm not writing, I'm not working for, for state-owned media. Never again. I will not say it's set foot on the... But then I began observing, say, the development of Ria Novosti. I saw, I covered the development as kind of business. I began reading their columnists, and then I, uh, after all, I, I accepted this invitation. And they never once changed, changed the world, and I did not really turn, turn behind anything. And that's, that's, that's another interesting phenomenon that, that in a way, state-run media is becoming more, I would not say progressive, but more tolerant and more liberal than the commercial one, because commercial one lives on very short money. Right, while the those that, that get uh, state funding, they can afford experimenting. They can afford, in, in a way, much more plurality, especially if it depends on the on the person. And that's that's one of those you know really strange paradoxes, which is hard to believe, which I did not believe myself before I was asked to write this column. And not a word ever. They don't even, which they should do. They don't even correct typos. <laughs> just, just a word, Ed pointed out quite rightly, there are four, I think, five seats at the front. So those standing at the back, if you'd like to sit down, do come forward to the front. Um, I just want to pick you up on one other thing before going back to Ed. Um, another phrase that Ed used was crony, crony capitalism and talked about these former KGB um, employees who he is describing as having taken a very cold analytical view of their country, realized communism didn't work, totalitarianism was brittle, and the empire expensive, so that they sort of moved from the Soviet way of running things to something which was moderated. Uh -huh. um, what's your comment on that? Does that Well, my comment is that cr cr chronic mm -hmm. capitalism is uh, basically the definition of the so-called radical economic reforms. When the young reformers, basically, what they did is uh, sort of inspired by Yeltsin, they basically distributed national assets to, to, to their friends and, and, and allies and relatives, etc. 
And, uh, and that was it. And then Putin, then this, this KGB guy was installed or as or let's say was appointed Yeltsin here for one basic reason. They, they needed a uh, somebody who will look after the system, preserve the Yeltsin and the democratic legacy, let's say, of the period of the young, of the radical economic reform on the one hand, and on the other hand, who would not sort of save them from, from any kind of legal persecution. So Putin has a double function, sort of protect their, their interests and not let, uh, let's say, people and communists touch them and bring them <laughs> and bring them to task. But eventually, I mean, the, 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 the amazing thing was that uh, Putin also somehow, just by sheer perception that, that he is not a he's not Yeltsin, that he's different from Yeltsin, although he's here, but he is really very different. That he, he really gained a lot of popularity, which has nothing to do with the press censorship, really. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's, 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 it's really genuine. We may like it or not, but it's, it's, it's really genuine. And also, he, he, he did another thing from this, Russia was in the state of, you know, this brown movement. It was kind of a, in the state of complete chaos. And he, more or less, uh, from a failed state, he, what Russia, again, under the previous regime, it was kind of a failed state. For, from that, more or less, he put down a state which does perform at least some functions to the people. And they do it in, a, in a very inadequately. There's lots of bureaucracy. There's what we now call, a, a friend of mine coined a very excellent term. Well, you probably heard about one of these ideologies of the Kremlin ideolo ideologues, which said a sovereign democracy, right? So my friend coined the term sovereign bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and th this is true, but, but still, it, it's more or less functioning state, which does very inefficiently with bribes, with a lot of uh, stealing, etc. It does perform some functions for, for, the, for, the, for the people. And that's important. I mean, you, you, if, if, if you would have uh, I don't know, experienced life in Russia between 1992 and 1999, you would understand why Russians are so happy that, that uh, at least there is stability, no turmoil, and they are getting their pensions, let's say, regularly every month and not with five to six months delay, right? As far as KGB is concerned, I don't know, uh, it's, it's, it's like, you know, K KGB, so it's, it's basically calling people KGB, it's uh, explaining them by, by their KGB origins. It's. Uh, well, it's, it's just about, it's, 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 it's irrelevant. For instance, it's, it's one of those crazy things that, that, that you realize. If, if you've heard about Vladimir Gusinsky, right, who was the owner of, of uh, NTV, the first Russian private television channel, etc., etc., and uh, that was then demolished by, by Putin, etc. All this, there was big scandals. So the chief of his analytical department of his company, was Philip Babkov. Philip Babkov mm -hmm. was the guy who was in charge of the fifth, in the Soviet times, of the fifth department of the KGB. And the fifth department was uh, entrusted with persecuting the dissidents. So this freedom of speech support, etc., etc., hired a general of the army of the KGB to do sort of analysis with him. But what is even worse, actually, I have actually met physical dissidents who, who were persecuted in those days, and living persons who said that Babkov, who even have some kind of warm feeling for Babkov, that he was, he was not the worst of them. If it weren't for Babkov, they would have uh, received uh, much harsher punishments than they did, and that Babkov's deputies were much worse than, than, than he was, and he was not always able to, to stop them. So KGB is like, it's, it's, it's a world in itself, it's well, on the one hand there's intelligence and uh, again as another dissident uh, uh, what's his name was but yeah, the great sculptor Edward yes. he, Ernst Nisbesnis he, he was saying that he actually he never met so many anti-Soviets as in the Central Committee as in the in the KGB mm -hmm. and that's and that's that's true so it, it's kind of it, it's 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 so mixed that, that simply the affiliation of a person with a KGB does not explain anything unless you know his background, his uh, connections, 
etc. So basically, this number of, of KGB people near Putin, I personally explain it by very simple fact. Those were the people who were near him. Those were people whom he actually trusted. And that's in the absence of really qualified personnel to run the country, and that's one of our, our greatest problems. It, it, it's very understandable that you form your teams uh, from the people that you've worked with, can more or less rely on, etc. But, just, sometimes, to pick you, but yeah. just to pick you up here, the fact that he has drawn people who he knew in the KGB into government with him doesn't necessarily mean that they were drawn from the wide cross-section of people who might have been in the KGB including many anti-Soviet yeah, sure, 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 sure. Of, of course, it, it, of course it's, it's, it's a network and they say once in the KGB, always in the KGB, there are no ex-KGB officers. But again, this is, this is true, but you really have to analyze all these networks uh, because this is really, they are very different. They have different backgrounds, different ideals, different interests, etc. And for, for another thing, which I was again amazed recently, to hear from a, a GRU officer, that's military intelligence, and a real, a real uh, intelligence officer, he worked as an undercover agent, not just like, let's say, Putin, who was sort of sitting face under, under the roof of the consulate or whatever it was in Dresden and actually risked no one. So a real undercover agent, uh, and I, I can even give his name because he's been publishing a lot, etc., etc. if you want. So he, wants, he recently said to me, that we at the intelligence schools, we were sort of taught to trust people. Because if you don't trust people in our job, you will soon go crazy. So he said, from time to time, I feel I, uh, like sending Putin back to in intelligence school and best uh, to get a better uh, sort of uh, better training in this how to trust people courses. Well, so well, this life is really full of paradoxes, I think. Well, we'll come on to the bigger questions of relations with the West in a minute, but I, it's interesting to go into this detail about A, the press, and B, the KGB and its legacy in Russia today. Because, um, Ed, what the picture that we're <coughs> getting from Alex is very subtle, it's very nuanced. As he says, and has said several times, it's quite paradoxical which doesn't necessarily fit in with the quite broad brush strokes that you've been giving us. So, Well, give me a few minutes. And, um, Sorry. I, you know, I, I, it's absolutely true that, we, I mean, the, the main point I've been trying to make is that this is not the Soviet Union redux. And it, it's preposterous to argue that, you know, Putin is the same as Andropov or that uh, United Russia is the same as the Communist Party. This is a, this is a different animal. And um, there is a lot of... There are a lot of safety valves, and I think that the, you know, the, the print media is a very good example of that. Another is that people can emigrate. I think uh, it's Yuryev, um, one of the, who wrote this appalling book, um, The Third Empire, Russia as it should be, said there are only two fundamental human rights that really matter, which is the right to change money and the right to emigrate. And of course, those were two absolute no-nos in the Soviet Union. You could go to jail for um, changing dollars, and you couldn't, if you wanted to emigrate, you had um, to be good swimmer. And uh, this was, uh, yeah, so, so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a qualitative shift away from that model of total control. And yes, we do have nuances in the media, um, particularly. Um, but you know, most Russians get their news from telly. And telly is, unless you have a particularly advanced satellite dish and can pick up RTVI, telly pretty much says the same thing morning, noon, and night. I did quite share this view of the KGB. I mean, I do think it's, yeah, it's I mean, the KGB realized, perhaps better than anybody, that the old Soviet system didn't work. That doesn't necessarily make them into Jeffersonian Democrats. And, um, and it seems to me that the the idea of the co this, of the corporatia, of the corporation, is pretty well attested. I mean, they, they, they've even talked about it occasionally in public. There's a sort of famous row with the Cheke I think it was Chekhesov made a, um, uh, a game, game and, and so on. So, and I think there is, and whether you call it a clan or a mindset or something in, in between, that there's, 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 there's a pretty strong KGB flavor, ex-KGB or an ex-GRU as well, at, at, the, at the top. And these are not nice people. And if you ever go to Moscow, I really recommend you go round the KGB museum, which is a building off the Lubyanka. And it's, um, and I mean, I, and I find it absolutely nauseating 
to see the way in which this organization, whose, or whose forebears, hands are drenched with the blood of tens of millions of people, makes out that they, in the 1930s, during the Great Terror, they, or, or we were victims too. You know, and I, I think this is like see, having a Gestapo museum in Berlin, you know, with nobody thinking there's anything wrong, wrong with it. And I think there's, you know, there's a real, you know, the, the, the failure to connect with the, the Stalinist terror of the 30s and all the bad things that, let's not forget, that happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s up to the present day and to make out, oh, well, that was just, you know, a few bad things that happened some time ago, I think it casts a real cloud over the ex-KGB's claim to be taken as just another, you know, as, as if it was a sort of Masonic lodge or something. Let's come on to um, the broader picture of relations with the outside world. Another thing that Alexis said is he's talked about inefficiency and, you know, control, but not very efficient control. So this relates specifically to the big question, which you address in your book, about how much is Russia really resurgent? How much is it really a threat? Right. Well, in the foreword to the new edition, I quote two really interesting pamphlets. One is by Nemtsov and Milov, who are kind of hard opposition, and both pretty well connected, former deputy prime minister, first deputy prime minister, former deputy energy minister. And they've written a very kind of, uh, I mean, quite tabloid, but I think very convincing thing called Putin the results or Putin the bottom line, and which highlights all the things from breaches of the constitution to bad infrastructure, failure to form public services, failure to form the military and so on. And then they brought out another one, uh, which is just about the kind of looting of Gazprom, which is absolutely astonishing, you know, billions and billions of dollars which have just disappeared from Gazprom over the last few years. And if you read that side by side with the Jürgens pamphlet, it's really interesting because Jürgens, Igor Jürgens, runs a kind of Medvedev think tank. He's one of these pro-Medvedev um, people, a very distinguished guy. And he's got, I think, something called the Challenge for Russia, which is also available, also in English, also footnoted in the book. And actually, it's amazing how similar they are. The language is a, is a little bit different. But there's a fantastic graph in this Jürgens book which shows on one axis the number of bureaucrats, and on the other axis, the length of the paved road network. And people often say Russia's only got two problems, fools and roads, and if you take the bureaucrats as a proxy for foods, for fools, and the roads the roads, this is in a way the chart. And it shows, as you would expect, the number of bureaucrats just rocketing up over the last eight years of Putinism, which is pretty striking, because they weren't short of bureaucrats even in 2000. And so this sort of, you know, chinovniki, I, lo I love the phrase sovereign bureaucracy, but, you know, the, you know the, the, the number of snouts at the trough is getting greater and greater and the pigs are getting bigger and bigger. Um, so that's one thing. And yet you'd expect with $1.3 trillion in extra oil and gas revenues over the last eight years coming in, you'd expect that you might have seen some improvement in the paved road network. And what you actually see is it goes up like this in the first couple of Putin years, and it goes down like that. It's actually the road network, according, and this is, according, this is not Nemtsov and Milov. This is not you know, oppositionists who would like this regime to go so they can come to power. This is people who are actually trying to make the Medvedev project work. The paved road network has actually shrunk. And we, this is what's so incredible to me when you say this is a modernizing project. Where are the new roads? Where are the new power stations? Where are the new hospitals? Where are the new world-class universities? You know, where's the anything? We've got you know, office blocks and you know, glitzy construction in Moscow. We've got, sure, we've got higher living standards, you know, shops full of, full of goods. Well, you'd expect that with all these petro-rubles. But actually, it seems to me that the result of this modernizing project is really people. Where are the new aircraft carriers? You know, about six years ago, they said they were going to build new aircraft carriers. They still haven't succeeded. In, in repairing and modernizing the Admiral Goshkov, which they want to sell to India, let alone build the new ones. When this flotilla went to Venezuela, it's on its way to Venezuela, um, which you know, took the great demonstration that you know, the Americans put their flotilla on the Black, Black Sea, well, we'll you know, stick a thumb in their eye and send a flotilla to the Caribbean. It included a vessel not normally seen when blue water navies want to project their power around the other side of the world, which was a sea tug. A what? A tug. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so I mean, I mean, it seems to me that, that I mean, the, 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 this. The, I suppose the, the, to tug the aircraft carrier. Well, I think the, the, no, because the, cause, the, no, because the Kuznetsov can't make it. Because they can't allow the Kuznetsov sure. to go to the Caribbean. So it wouldn't make. Yeah, the Piotr Veliki will probably get that. It's the most seaworthy ship in the Russian Navy, or twenty <laughs> seaworthy major ships that they have. 
but you know, they had to take a seat. And, and I, so, I, I mean, I have a big question mark about how the regime is going to explain away where all this money went. Where's the modernization? Well, you know, they can destroy the, you know, they can attack Georgia, which is like seeing a guy in crutches could beat up a guy in a wheelchair, you know, a much smaller man in a wheelchair. But you know, they could probably def attack the Baltic states if NATO didn't come to their aid. But the Polish general staff said in a, a briefing, which I don't think has been sort of exactly published, but it's been leaked, they said if, if NATO did not come to our aid in Poland, and if we were attacked in a one-on-one -on -one fight with the Russians against us, we would be able to fight them to a standstill unless the Germans attack us in the back again. <laughs> Okay, Alex, yeah. Yeah. Chance, well, well, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm perfectly, I, I, I'm here in agreement with... Uh, no, we have to disagree, come on. No, 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 it's, it's as I say, the, the thing is that, that, once again, they won't have to explain anything in a sense, because it's exactly the whole, the whole uh, idea of the succession project, of the project successor, why the power is being sort of transferred from a president to why he appoints successor, is exactly not to explain uh, these kind of things. But that's point one. But point two is that people voted for successors really sincerely. Because you just, again, it's, you, you just can't imagine the strain of living there in 19, between 19, let's say, 87 and 88 and 1990 or 2000, that for you a great improvement that you value above all is that you just get your pension every month on time. And that people are getting jobs, etc., etc. This is, again, this is one of those amazing things when this democratic and market reform, uh, they started from very high aspirations, but the way they, they developed, they put the aspirations so low that people are just sort of really happy with being left alone. So they really won't have to, and even, even this is a more, more, more modernization. Because if you take like, small, uh, small and medium-sized business, it's still uh, prospering and corruption does affect it, but not that much. So people are getting better jobs. Now I think the heavy industry is uh, getting momentum. For instance, when you come after a while, what, like two years ago, I came to, to after a, 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 an interval of, I don't know, several years, I came, came to Pierre, that's a major ta city on the, uh, in the, um, in the Urals, defense-oriented, and uh, the, pe the people have, have jobs now. The, these defense industries there, uh, people have jobs, and it's, 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 it's kind of completely different look. They look mm. uh, seven years ago, etc. The other thing is, again, for which I have, no explanation. If people in defense industry have jobs, why Russian army is so much behind in this procurement of modern uh, weaponry? That's another interesting question. If they produce something, why it never reaches the army and it still has to fight with the, uh, with the old Soviet, Soviet time uh, so weapons and kill sort of people they didn't have to kill in. Uh, in, uh, in Georgia, but that's it's, but you still feel the improvement. And again, you have to really feel, and you have, you have to survive this. It's difficult to explain, really, when you were sort of what happened to the people. And that, that even a, a tiny, tiny predi predictability that, that you know that, uh, let's say, normal reaction between, let's say, 92 and 1999 was thinking in the morning whether you will have something to, to eat. Uh, for, 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 for supper, and now we can plan, let's say, a week ahead, and that's a, a, this is a tremendous improvement, really. So it's, 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 it's very different level of expectation. Actually, can I just ask you, just as a little thought experiment, just imagine that Yeltsin had had Putin's oil price and Putin had had Yeltsin's oil price. Do you think he might look a bit different? Mm -hmm. I didn't get if, 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 if Yeltsin had had the oil price of $100 a barrel that Putin had, and if Putin had to cope with the oil price of $20 a barrel that Yeltsin had, do you think it might look a bit different? No, I don't think so. Because it's, it's like, you know, Russia is a big country and then capital began to flow out of the country when, uh, when the oil price was at 8% uh, eight, uh, eight or whatever. So this money, had to, that, this money that was stolen from the Russian people had to come from somewhere. And I mean, you can't imagine the, the, the richness of the country, and it's, it's just the, 
the fundamentally wrong economic policy when you are kind of subjecting an industrialized but rather inefficient economy to liberal reform that is opening it to, to competition with those who are much stronger, you are bound to, to, to collapse at uh, no matter what price of oil is there. I must say, Russians have said to me quite a lot. I, mean, I, I chaired a debate in Russia a few years ago, and one of the questions was, where do you see Russia's main threat coming from? And I said, you know, possibly the <laughs> south, you know, the turbulent Middle East, or is it the West, is it NATO, or is it the yellow peril, the Chinese on the eastern border? And a lot of people put up their hands, and they said it's high oil prices, because they act as a deterrent mm. to reform. Yeah. So therefore, you know, the yeah. argument might be, in the Yeltsin years, there might have been less reform, if that yes. was the point of your argument. But what I'm interested here is, it seems we have a sort of point of consensus between the two of you, that Russia isn't really resurgent. I mean, yes, it's revived to some extent, given the state it was in, well, but that you couldn't say it's really that powerful. Well, I, I, I think one can no, it's not argue, at all. You can not argue about the definition of, <laughs> of resurgent in the sort of real... I mean, uh, yeah, if one was a, you know, looking at it from the point of view, a Russophile point of view, what one would like to see resurgent is Russia's moral authority. You know, Russia as a country that is admired and liked and respected but the, but the rather than being feared. And I don't think we've got that. But what I do think we've got is um, the Kremlin sitting on a big pile of money, which it is using quite effectively. And they're using it um, effectively inside mm -hmm. Russia, more or less, to, for their own purposes, not for the benefit of the Russian people, but for their purposes. And they're using it effectively in, um, in other countries. And I think that's, <coughs> a, and that's a problem for us. Would you say it's a threat? Well, it's certainly a threat because the... We have seen, I mean, I think the, what we have got now, which we didn't have during the Cold War, is this extraordinary division in the West, where you have, I mean, I was at the Bucharest summit, um, the NATO Bucharest summit, and the shock for the Poles and the Czechs and the Balts and the other East European countries, when Steinmeier, the German foreign minister, said very bluntly, sorry guys, you may care a lot about Ukraine, in the polls had just said this is in our absolute national strategic interest that Ukraine has some kind of security perspective, some clear security perspective to join NATO. And this really matters to Poland. And Steinmeier said, sorry guys, we mind more about Russia than we mind about you. I paraphrase only very slightly. And you know, we have got we and we saw a an opinion poll in the FT two weeks ago, which showed that the majority of Germans in a plurality of Spanish and Italians said that if the Baltic states were attacked militarily by Russia, they would not support their countries going to war in their defense. These are extraordinary shifts. That would have been absolutely inconceivable 25 years ago. If you'd said, if, um, to, if you say the Baltic states were kind of West Berlin, you know, strategically and symbolically important, very hard to defend, there was absolutely no doubt during the Cold War that if the Soviet Union attacked West Berlin, that would be the start of a real war. And, we, and it didn't matter whether you were in Spain or northern Norway. That was part of something that we stood behind with the principle of collective security. And I think that's gone. It's gone both in military terms, which I admit is a very unlikely. I don't think this is going to happen. I agree with Alexei there. I think Georgia was one off. But we also see it in energy terms, that we have Russia pursuing very successful energy policies with both the Nord, Nord Stream and the South Stream pipeline, and the EU, which is in a position of of great and growing vulnerability because of Russia's ability to be the monopoly gas supplier, absolutely floundering. You know, the EU has one policy, which is Nabucco, and it ain't working. That's the, 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 we need a map, really. That's the idea of bringing gas from Central Asia and Azerbaijan through Turkey and the Balkans into Central Europe, just to create some kind of bargaining counterweight to the, to, to, to the Russian-supplied gas. And that policy is in tatters. Um, OK, well, we've talked a bit about um, how powerful Russia is and whether or not it's a threat. Um, we've, you've both mentioned Georgia, and you both agreed that it was a one-off. Let's, let's roll forward to today, because it would be nice to come to the audience. Here we've had um, a month and a half of financial turmoil with um, an enormous amount of fluctuation in Moscow. How does this change the picture? Um, Alexei, first. Well, I would say that, that back home... I think it, it changed the picture by actually wiping out uh, very painful uh, memories of, of, of the war and just the feeling, because it's for, for the Russians, it's kind of, you know, the 
the personal tragedy that Russians and Georgians are feeling each other, are fighting each other, that was on the level of unsinkable, and that kind of means that if, if this happened, then, then a nuclear war might happen. So, but I suppose now with this uh, nuclear crisis, uh, financial crisis, this has, this is largely, this is largely wiped out, and then people are entertaining themselves with, uh, with the crisis, what, what's going on. As far as the, uh, well, my feeling is again, I'm not an expert on this, but my feeling is that. Uh, the main uh, impact is that, well, Russia, this is for, for one, this particular crisis is not of our own making. And we have very little influence on how it develops, and we can do really little either to, to, to intervene in our own economy or on a global scale. Uh, because I mean, nobody knows what, what's going to happen to the dollar or to, to the euro, what, what's going to be the exchange, what to do with all these things. So basically I think that the, it has changed the things that Russia is more or less sitting on the sidelines and waiting what's, what's, uh, how the situation with the big guys will, will, will develop. So do people feel reassured by that? Or do well, they, people has feel it that, you know... Has it, it undermined their sense of their own if, country's if, if, power? If, if, I mean, the people. Don't, I don't think that people are thinking very much in, in, in terms of, you know, their own country's power. I would say that the prevalent. I mean, there's no panic, because exactly now people understand that whatever they do, they will uh, do make a mistake. So, the current situation in Russia vis-à-vis -vis this, this financial crisis, I would describe with a phrase alleged, allegedly from a British military manual, which says, "If rape is inevitable, try to relax and then have fun." <laughs> that's that's all, that's that's the mood in the that's the mood in the country now. I I'd like to, I I I I'm speechless really. I I um <laughs> doesn't happen very often. Um I I I would like to have some really hostile. I mean I, I feel we're not disagreeing enough. So no. I want do some you, do you I want some that, chucks and rocks in the audience. Do you think that's right, Edward? That, that the tensions rose. Certainly the rhetorical tensions rose in the wake of uh, in in August. <laughs> around Georgia. They abated slightly in September. There's now been an overwhelming preoccupation with what's happening financially. The Russian markets have suffered, been hit more, probably more than anybody. Um, no, Ukraine's been hit worse. Okay, all right. Um, but certainly um, from a, a position of Russia saying that it was um, financially doing very well, it's had a knock. Yeah. Um, but has it actually, as Alexei says, wiped off the top of the agenda worries about how you should deal with Russia because Western governments have other things on their mind now. They don't need yet another problem, a crisis with Russia. Yeah. No, I, th I think that, I mean, th there's a huge divide now between ca countries that are cash rich and countries that are cash hungry. And Russia is cash rich. I mean, even if the financial system in Moscow doesn't work very well, even if they have these highly politicized bailouts, and no doubt many billions are going to be stolen because they'll be given to we are one lot of favoured insiders rather than another lot. It, Russia is pretty well placed to ride this out in a way that other countries aren't. Russia has a current account surplus. Every other country in the former Soviet empire has a current account deficit, I think I'm right in saying. Certainly I can't think of another one that has a current account surplus. And so you know, there's, a, there's a fundamental difference there, and that's something that can be, um, that can be exploited um, if, they, if they choose. I was really amazed to see the, the very audacious offer of a 5 billion euro um, bailout to Iceland and to see the Iceland in this Iceland, a NATO country, scurrying off to Moscow to beg for this uh, offer of 5 billion dollars. I thought, I mean, I don't know whether the deal's going to be done, but even just as a symbolic act, I thought it was highly, it was, it was, it was hi, hi, highly effective. Um, and I think it's also interesting the way in which Putin particularly, but also Medvedev, have used this as a way of bashing the, the West. And Putin, said, I think, said yesterday, this shows that the American thinking has infested the world financial system. And it's yet another you know, useful stick to beat this sort of very battered image of the West as, a, as any kind of model. You know, they were wrong about democracy, they were wrong about economic reform in Russia, now they can't even run their own economies properly. So why should Earth should we listen to anything that they say? And that's, that's, quite, a, that's quite a powerful message, and one that they're, I think, saying with a degree of, of, of schadenfreude. 
So do you think in terms of east-west tension that um, the danger of the was one is abated slightly because of this? Well, I think in Georgia, Russia got very much what it wanted. And it, I mean, perhaps, I mean, it was a many, there were many layers to this, but one thing they were able to see was that the West was too divided to stand up to them. I mean, and it was a great pity. We had a wonderful economist cover, which we didn't use in this country because we had a British economic crisis on the cover. But the, for the European and American editions, it was a picture of a jelly. And on the jelly were the faces of the, Euro of the leaders of the European Union. And the caption was, <coughs> Europe stands up to Russia. <laughs> and I think it's absolutely not been lost on the Kremlin that you know, when Sarkozy wanted to issue a statement on behalf of the European Union condemning the... Um, well, this is a time when you had Russian troops um, manning checkpoints on the main east-west highway in Georgia and he had gone way beyond any kind of countermeasure to the um, Georgian attack on, on South Ossetia. And Berlusconi vetoed it. If you read it very carefully, this statement does not say, as it should do in EU sort of bureaucrat speak, on behalf of the European Union, the European presidency <coughs> says blah, 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 because Berlusconi wouldn't have it. It just was issued solely in the name of the presidency. Of the, and we saw that in the, the, in the end, Russia got this absolutely pathetic sanction of a cross press release and the suspension of partnership and cooperation agreement talks, which Russia had already said it didn't really care about. So, I mean, that's a very powerful lesson um, from inside, I mean, in, inside the former Soviet space to the Kremlin, and actually in the West as well, that we are able to do things that the West will complain about fairly loudly in the case of some countries, not at all in the case of others, and in the end they won't do anything. Well, if, 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 if I may interfere here, as at least I think here at last we will, we will disagree, I would say that, that uh, in Georgia, I think Russia g did a good service to, 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 to the West, particularly and to, to NATO and to the West in general, to take a closer look at what kind of people they are choosing for their allies. Because it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it, it's an insanity actually. The whole situation that Saakashvili, the president of the nation of four million people, attacks, de facto attacks Russia to beat into obedience 18,000 people who definitely, of Ossetians, who definitely do not want to, to stay with Germany. Oh, uh, with, sorry, <laughs> sorry. For, That's my line. Uh, uh, with, uh, with, with, with Georgia, who had been de facto independent uh, for 17 years. <coughs> And so, basically, I mean, the only, the only result this uh, Saakashvili attack could have is basically drive away the remaining 18,000 or even less from Ossetia and just conquer, conquer the territory. That's it. I mean, ca can you imagine just the difference? Can you imagine Cuba attacking, let's say, Guantanamo in the United States? What would have, in, on its own territory, what, 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 would, what, would, what would have been left in, uh, uh, of, of Cuba? And again, the thing is that, that this, this is, the West is, is selecting very strange type of people. I mean, I, I'm really shivering when, when Edward is saying that, you know, Poles are saying, what if Russians are attacking us or the Baltic, are, or the Baltic people are saying us, this is your new allies. They are completely, from what they say, they are completely sick people. But I'm sorry, Alexei, why Russia Alexei, would attack, for God's sake, for what, why would it attack? Alexei, Poland, every, et year, every year, for the last three years, the Peskov Division, which is the, right next to the Baltic States, has done major military exercises on how to reconquer the Baltic States under the title of Operation Return. Are you surprised they're not just a little bit paranoid about that? Well, I suppose I mean, if there is a Peskov Division, they have to make some kind of exercises. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, they, they have to be there. They, there were no major exercises for, 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 for 15 years, as I said. Russia bought in eight years of its so-called rearmament. They bought uh, two combat planes in eight years, this modernizing Russia. Now Russia, it was decided that it will cut its army from one, uh, so I think, one billion... 130 people, the plan to, to 1 million, the plan were to do this by, by the year to 216. Now they've decided to, to do it by the year 212. They're cutting down, I think, 200,000 officers, 500 uh, probably generals, numerous number of, 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 of uh, 
of uh, kernels. There are, Russia is basically, you may call it, some, some people call it shaping up its army, others say it's kind of disarmament, unilateral disarmament. I mean, if, if it's paranoid, the way you say it, you, 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 you view these things, you are, you are really sort of uh, bringing on yourself this danger, because you are st when you start speaking about a, an imagined threat, it may well become, uh, become real, but not otherwise. Mm -hmm. Because all this paranoia, all this NATO expansion, etc. and what, what is NATO? NATO is a kind of, it's a fat bureaucracy, every bureaucracy is is uh, tends to expand. They they make a huge fuss when they have to send 700 people to Afghanistan, which is probably the only good cause for where where they fight now. Yeah, and and, and, and then I mean, then, but 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 Russia is worrying. Really, they are really nervous. And why why make them nervous for just for the sake of uh, you know people sitting in Brussels adding their their stuff? And satisfying the sick uh, egos of of of, uh, of newly democratic states, and I'm sp speaking in these terms because, you know, Putin once said that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe uh, of the 20th century, and I rephrased it saying that it was the greatest uh, psychiatric catastrophe of the 20th century because it, it did produce an amazing number of very strange people, <laughs> starting, starting with our own Yeltsin, Saakashvili, uh, Gamsakhurdi, actually, the first Georgian president, who was the first to start, uh, actually, to whom all these current problems can, can easily be attributed. Uh, Kadyrov is, is, is a different story. I will start here. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I will start with Dudaev here. Actually, it's, it's again Kadyrov is an inevitable result of. There's of, some hands uh, going up, so let's uh, let's let's hear, let's hear for some people. Yes, put your hands up and wait for the microphone. There's a gentleman here. It's a hand up. I'll take a few at once, and then we'll come back to the panel and hopefully have some more. So try and keep it brief. Do say who you are if you'd like to. Um, Alexa, uh, uh, is the microphone working? Hello. Hello. Yes. yes sorry. Do you want to say your name? Yeah, no? uh, my name is Luke uh, Douglas Hume. A lot of my friends uh, who have uh, foreign correspondents and freelance journalists, etc., they have said no, but they have, quite a lot of them have been approached by the various secret services. I was just wondering, have you, being a, very involved in the media in Russia, ever been approached by the KGB? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Never. That's a quick answer. Oh, well, actually, I was once. Actually, I was once yeah, well, during the... the the perestroik year, but it's, uh, it was only uh, sort of later uh, that it occurred to me that the guy who once asked me to, uh, there was, uh, I was in academia then, who asked me to take, there was one of those peace forums, etc. and so there was a guy who told me that you must accompany academician, he was just released from, 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 from Gorky, so he would say you must accompany uh, academician center of everyone, including to the toilet that he feels comfortable. And uh, OK, of course, I accompanied, accompanied the academician Sakharov to the toilet. But it was only later that occurred to me that this guy may have been from the KGB and then he sort of authorized me with some very important mission. But I didn't have to report anything. I mean, that, that's, that's the OK, let, let's, let's take a few comments before we come back to the panels to fit some people in. There's a, a gentleman here. Questions? Comments. Keep them brief. Say who you are. You My name's Colin. I want to uh, have a go at Edward, if that's possible. <laughs> You're a man who sits on the small island on the edge of Europe. Uh, we're sitting here looking at a book which is effectively leveraging Cold War propaganda of the past. Um, you've been complaining about Russian uh, inefficiency, its inability to build warships, <laughs> And yet it's precisely that inefficiency that's going to protect the West. Because without that inefficiency, you're not, they will come and they will attack. If they, are a, um, if they get their act together and became hugely efficient, you would be in real trouble. So the idea that um, you know, they should get their act together more is actually the, th is actually the threat in itself. I take the uh, example of Germany, who understand the importance of managing the great 
bear on the edge of Europe. They have understood, and perhaps in their statements about uh, the Baltic states, that's actually what they, they may mean. Um, yeah? Yeah. Okay. It's all right. I'll answer it anyway. Let's go back. There's some more hands up here. Yeah, please, um, that, this gentleman and then the lady there. I'll come to the other side in a minute. Uh, Zurab Kudalashvili, independent journalist. Uh, uh, thanks for teaching uh, West to uh, choose the allies. We know Russian allies. Um, a question is it's about uh, what ideology is in Russia now? Because uh, how I remember uh, Russia and Russians don't uh, live without ideology a uh, long time. Questions to both sides, please. Okay. Um, there's a lady here. Yeah. Pass the microphone over. My question uh, relates to Chechnya, and if uh, Russia is not resurgent but revived, I'm just wondering what the somewhat new order means for those republics that didn't make it to independence, and if both um, panelists could answer as to what this new order means for Chechnya. Okay, let's just take a couple more before we come back to the panel. There's a gentleman here. Thank you, Adam, your uh, postgraduate student at UCL. I just wanted to ask, do you not think that the problem is um, the fact that we in the West are, to put a, a perhaps coin a phrase, o over ideologicizing the problem, and in the West we're overlooking perhaps the fact that Russia has very, very pragmatic, strategic <laughs> reasons for its actions, which we're not taking into account. The fact that it has a... Uh, a set defence policy which seems to uh, rest around um, Sevastopol and its uh, fleet there, and I, I think it's quite reasonable f uh, to some extent for Russia to uh, to set a defence policy. So, do you think that the fact that in trying to frame questions in an ideological matter, we're overlooking uh, the fact that Russia has very, very pragmatic? Uh, interests, or do you think that this is a problem with Russia and, uh, perhaps not being able to update its uh, um, very, very um, up-to-date military, or um, not tr not being able to up update its uh, military defence strategy? Okay, um, let's answer those. Otherwise, everyone will forget what was asked. Yeah, okay. um, I'll just just a reminder. Um, uh, a question to you, Ed, about your book being. Cold War propaganda and um, having a go at Russia for being inefficient. Well, if it was more efficient, wouldn't it be more of a threat? Um, what the ideology is in Russia now, that's to both of you. Chechnya, to both of you. And um, another ideology question is the West being too ideological, and actually Russia's concerns are rather pragmatic. Let's come to Andre first and then. Uh, okay. Okay, well, oh, let, let's start with uh, what ideology. I, I really have no idea what kind of ideology there is because when you watch TV, you have uh, an idea that of one type of ideology, you switch to, to another channel, to entertainment channel. And it's very funny how some sort of patriotic movies are uh, surrounded by um, entertainment formats completely borrowed from, from, from the West. Uh, sort of by Western models, etc. You switch on uh, internet, and there's lots of everything on internet. Uh, you go to say Echo Moscow, which is uh, the radio station, which is broadcast throughout the country, and there you would get, let's say, Yeltsin time uh, lamentations. So I don't think there's much ideology. I would say what 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 really was 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 recently. And I think, again, I would not say for the whole Russia, but for the people of my type, uh, of, of, uh, that is independent, uh, pro-Western, etc., I think that because of, of, of this Georgian war, there was really a, a sense of personal tragedy, really, that Russians are fighting the, the, the uh, Georgians. And also, we were really fed up, I think, we, we became much less I would say pro-Western, because of this completely biased coverage of what it looked from Russia's biased coverage of the situation. So these two things were quite important for, for a uh, rather, I would say, uh, important strat of, of, of the society. So this point one. Set point two was about, oh, Chechnya, I think it's, it's, it's a pragmatic solution, and I think that, that there's, again, there's no order, there's no new order. 
is that Putin is in, and, and, and the people there are quite happy that somebody at least puts a semblance of order in Chechnya, whatever it is, because it's, it's such a situation that, that uh, at least this is not, at least Chechnya is not a headache for them. There are much worse things uh, that are happening now in <coughs> Ingushetia and in uh, Dagestan, with which they, I think, they have absolutely have no idea what to do. So I think they're not thinking in terms of orders, but they're thinking in terms of reacting to, to crises that are emerging here and there, etc. And they're not very well equipped to deal with them. Point two, and what was? But um, pragmatic is Russia driven? Is Russian? Kremlin policy driven by pragmatism rather than yeah, ideology? Of, of course, there's, I don't think there's any, there's any ideology other than, than uh, self-serving, let's say, uh, things. But pragmatism, well, I suppose, well, they, uh, they understand again, if, if, we, if, we, if we speak in terms of purely projection, this rubbish like projection of military power, etc., etc., everyone in the Kremlin understands that, that uh, the military budget of the European Union is something like 500 billion euros. The military budget of Russia is 34, I think, billion. Uh, 34 billion rubles. This is it. That, that, that drives the borders for your pragmatism. If we start, if, if we start building, let's say, let's say now, re rearmament ships, etc., etc., the first ship, uh, this warship, will come off these uh, the wharfs or whatever it's called in 10 years. In 10 years, that's a good time to, to, to really find accommodation and not make each other nervous, etc. So they're very pragmatic. They're very pragmatic, rational, and seeing people, they understand the limitation of their power. They sometimes they bluff. They enjoy bluffing, but uh, they're very rational people who are not on their own accord, who are not doing any, any adventures. OK, Ed. Right. Um, I think that it's really important to bear in mind the cost of this regime to Russians. Average male life, in, life expectancy, 59 years. If you look at Mar Murray Feshbach's piece in the Washington Post, I think two Sundays ago, paints a really <coughs> dismal picture of the public health picture, multidrug resistant TB, AIDS, infant mortality, I and mean, every indicator just looking really, really bad. And so I think it's, it's not that one should sit here and say, yippee, Russia's weak, or hurrah, Russia's strong. It's in the interest of the people of Russia that the state functions properly, and I would argue that it's not, and I explain the book why. Um, even if they manage to adopt a kind of you know, mobilization model of the economy, as it's sometimes talked about, managed to stop all the tremendous stealing in the VPK, in the military industrial complex, were able to pop aircraft carriers off at the rate of you know, one a year or something. Even then, Russia is a country of only 140 million people. The European Union alone is 450. Russia's economy is one-tenth, probably even one-fifteenth, depending on how you measure it, the size of the European Union. So even if, they, even if these people were both very nasty and highly competent, it still wouldn't be a threat in the way that the Soviet Union was a threat, where you had a rough parity between two global blocks. I, you know, and I think, you know, if you get as far as page 10 in the book, you'll see that I, that I, I argue that as um, powerfully as I can. Um, on the ideology question, I think this is really interesting, because if you're really optimistic, you could argue that they're just crooks, that this whole thing is just made up in order to steal billions and billions of dollars from the Russian people. They don't believe any of it. And that would be, in a way, a kind of optimistic um, scenario. If you're more pessimistic, you might believe, you might think they actually believe some of their own propaganda. And it's quite interesting. I mean, I, and, I, and I take Alexei's point that this is still better than 1990s in some ways. Absolutely true. But you know, there is a downside, which is all this poisonous garbage which is being poured out on state television, which I think eventually is going to have an effect. And when people say, oh, don't worry, it's just for internal consumption, well, you know, when things that you consume affect the way you are. We are what we, we, we eat. And so I do worry a bit when I see that on this bizarre program where, um, what was it, Patrushev was talking about lessons we have to learn from Byzantium, for example. Um, yeah, the, the sort of, I think I mentioned before, this idea of red, brown, and white, Soviet nostalgia, czarist nostalgia, small f, fascism, cult of the personality, thuggish sort of mass movements like Nashi and so on. Very odd cocktail. Don't know which way it's, 
it's going to go, but it doesn't look very nice. And you, you could say that sovereign democracy and it clearly isn't an ideology the way that Marxism was. You could actually study Marxism. It was a proper political philosophy. You could read you know, endless books about it. If you put sovereign democracy, you try to write it down, you'd have something about the size of this sheet of paper which say, sit down, shut up, give us money. Russia's great. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not a proper, it's not a proper ideology in that sense. One could perhaps call it a dogma. On Chechnya, um, I, I, I basically I'd agree with what Alexei said. I mean, there's a kind of far fighting going on in the North Caucasus. Chechnya is calm at the moment, but things are looking very dodgy in Ingushetia, and they've looked very bad in Dagestan in the past. Um, what I would say, I think the remarkable thing is that the the decolonization of the Caucasus has been absolutely spectacular. Russians have left in their tens, in their hundreds of thousands from the North Caucasus. And there are probably fewer Russians living there now than there were at the end of the 19th century. And this has been a really striking thing. That you have you know, a sort of ethnically homogenous Chechnya, which you didn't, didn't have before, admittedly under a guy who for now is, lo is loyal to the Kremlin, but that can change. Um, just one note on Georgia. I, mean, I do think it's important to remember that we had constant provocations from the Russian side over the last couple of years. You know, we had a helicopter attack on the Kadori Gorge um, in the middle of the night. We had a Russian plane flying over and trying to blow up with a missile a, Rus a, a Georgian radar station. We had the deportation of scores of Russian, of sometimes even of Russian citizens with Georgian names or Georgians from Moscow, Ge deportations in which two people actually died. Yeah, th this didn't start overnight with Saakashvili um, making his highly unwise um, but possibly justified, you can argue backs and forwards whether it was or wasn't, um, move to stop the shelling of the Georgian-controlled villages in South Ossetia. There's a long backstory to this, and it seems to me that, wasn't, you know, that, that one has to ask what was it about Georgia and about Saakashvili that the Kremlin found so provocative and so threatening? Why did they so badly want to topple him? Um, more questions. Hands up. Yes, let's go for ah, the back. Um, gentleman right behind you, and then the lady in red. I'd like to ask both of you gentlemen, if I may, about the elephant which should be in the room, which is Chechnya. When, could I ask when either of you were last in Chechnya? Because the Chechnya you described was not what I saw this summer when I was there. Uh, right. Yeah, okay. Just wanted to ask Alexia, um, does he have any feel for where Russia would see its future? I mean, would it perhaps see itself as part of the European Union in the longer term, or uh, building up to be a, a superpower as it was in the past, um, sort of against uh, America? I think there are alternatives, and it would be nice to know if there's any thought on that. Uh, right, yes. Um, gentleman in the striped shirt. I'd like to know what the panel make of the recent and fairly brutal shutting down of the English language, uh, Moscow Daily, the exile. OK, um, there's a gentleman next to him, yeah. Um, I'd like to know what both panellists make of a, a much poorer Russia. At the moment, we have a Russia which has spent somewhere in the region of $197 billion this year supporting its own economy. What would you make of a Russia which is uh, with a lower oil price and which is maybe a bit more dependent on uh, international finance? Right, OK. Um, let's come forward. Um, this gentleman here in purple. Um, I have a question to Mr. Pankin. Uh, I mean, we're here in London, but you're in Moscow. You must be sitting on a gold mine of various uh, groundbreaking stories and exposés. Um, as a sort of semi-independent journalist, what was your most critical uh, story, most controversial story, um, since uh, you were, as you say, fired from Izvestia? Thank you. OK. Um, uh, yeah, lady next to him. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to ask Alexi. You, you Can speak mentioned. Up a bit? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask Alexi. You, you mentioned that uh, a certain part of the population was lost to television, um, and you seem to. I, I didn't quite understand what you meant. Whether you meant that there's some concern that um, in among the state control, the, the state controlling oh. that medium. Uh, that those people have been lost. Is there something being done to make state television or television generally more liberal? 
Okay, let's just take one more. Let's, um, yeah, again, okay, this gentleman, and we'll um, have another round. This is one to Edward. You mentioned moral authority. Isn't it uh, premature and a little naive to expect moral authority from a country that had almost 75 years of communism, 17 years of transition? Aren't we being a little impatient? Okay, um, I'll just go through those. Alex, a bit, um, as you, um, I only get the pen rather okay. lacking. Okay. And you will, well, I haven't been to Chech Chech Chechnya ever. I sort of my, uh, and I'm not. That's why I'm not describing it. By the way, I I, I, I know the, the the region quite well. I was traveling there ever before. Everyone in Moscow or in uh, even in, in in the West heard about that there's such thing as Northern Caucasus. But uh, in the last years, I've I've never been there. Uh, dependent on oh, dr dream for Russia. Well, I suppose that now the crisis presents an excellent opportunity to finally, first of all, finally turn to a saner uh, <coughs> economic policy. Crisis kind of normal anti-crisis economic policy is protectionist, and I think Russia does need to 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 really support its industry. It needs not so much rearmament as reindustrialization. Mm -hmm. And while the, some caterers are there, etc., I think this is a good chance. We, I, of course, protectionism does not mean isolation, as we all know. It's just a different uh, modal than liberalism. But I think that many countries will be turning to crisis. Is sort of usually produces protectionist feelings. But I think Russia needs it more than than anything else. Most critical, you know, I'm not not so much a journalist. I'm I'm a I'm a, uh, I'm a columnist. I'm not on digging stories. I'm a commentator, and, and I can't tell you actually what was the most controversial or critical, because I'm contributing one column a week, Moscow Times, Ria Novosti. But what has had the most reverberation else? from your comment from your columns? Oh. What has had the most reverberation? Which which has had the most um, controversy? Or feedback that you've had from it. I, I, I really don't. I don't remember. No, it's it's kind of a, it's, it's 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 a stream. Well, you wrote an excellent one about the cyber attack on Commerçant, for example. I remember reading that with interest. Uh -huh, uh -huh, probably, but but really, I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I, I can't remember, and I, often I can't even remember what I have to do a column for next week for Ria Novosti for Russian audience or for. Uh, the Moscow Times, that uh, English-speaking audience was slightly different mentality. Mm. So no, I'm not. A, I'm not a reporter, and I hardly remember. But do you get feedback from your? Yeah, comments? yeah. People are people are people are writing. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are comments on Ria Novosti. Some of them are commented upon. But it's it's again it's it's the sad story because when you're writing smart, uh, you you got no feedbacks. When you are sort of stick to to very simple and. Uh, and uh, cl clear-cut primitive statements. You got floods of mail, etc. So I, I sort of usually I, I alternate because between being smart and being popular. Do you think it's why they don't edit your stories? Huh? Do you think this is why they don't edit your stories? They don't edit your stories. Is this why the Well, I, I I do not know. You see, my my relations with the both Moscow Times and. Uh, Ria Novosti is that I, I, I submit a column every uh, sort of second week to, to either, and uh, there's a fixed number of, of uh, what is it called, Fig the fixed number of characters. And this is, but that's the rule of the game, actually. That's the rule of the game. I ran the My, my Izvestia uh, the same way, particularly. I did not edit uh, columnists' contributions. Like I could ask additional questions, but to regular columnists never, so I think it's, it's, it's kind of a norm. <laughs> Moral authority. Oh, just one more press question. There's a question there about um, the authorities being concerned that people weren't watching television. What are they going to do oh, about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that there is a, well, you know, the television, it, it has to be efficient, right? And when, when, the, when, when, the, when the independent minded people stop watching news, it means that they are, it is, it is inefficient, even from the Kremlin point of view. In other words, they are beginning to think for ways, for formats that would return this public back to television. But these formats, again, will have to, to, to take into account that they, are want, they want to take back more intelligent people who would not buy all the rubbish that is being sort of poured on the people with low 
level of critical thinking. I don't know what will come of that, but I feel some traces that they are beginning to consider. So basically, it means higher efficiency being, means more pluralism, more livelier programs, etc. But we will see what will happen because you know that the, the war and the crisis is not particularly good time for for for. <laughs> more liberal for, 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 for better television. Yeah. As far as moral authority, I think that one way, if, if I'm not. Go ahead, quickly. Just one, one thing. You see, the moral authority, which is something that does not understand that if Russia did not want to become independent from the Soviet Union, most other republics would still be more or less in the Soviet Union. So Russia is the liberator of every other. Let's say, well, Baltics have always been special, and nobody considered them, by, by the way, among our own. But Russia had actually, with its own separated from the Soviet Union, Russia has liberated the other, how much is it, 12 republics. Without this, they will still be within this realm. If Yeltsin hadn't reached an agreement with the Ukrainian and no, no, the no, other Russian yeah, leaders, but, but, uh, but then the Soviet Union would have stayed here. Sure. And, and not, not only that, if, if he did not hate uh, Gorbachev so much. Because he was just, to get rid of Gorbachev, he was running around and say Russia will support this independence and your independence and your independence, etc. So in a way, and that plus, of course, Belovetsky push. So that's where the moral authority should, should basically stem from. Russia is the liberator of every other, with the exception of the Baltics, of every other Soviet republic. And now it, it is still on it. There come uh, all these, you know, hatreds and discussions whether Russia is going to attack the Baltics or the Poles or whatever. So I well, think there has been a change of the, a, cha a change of government been. since it's then. Still, it's still the same, the same Russia. It's not. Let's come on to Ed. Okay. okay. Um, very quickly, in, in no particular order, I, I, the exile is just a joke. You know, I just don't think it's worth dignifying the Frontline Club with a detailed discussion about the exile. So I won't. Um, if you're interested, you can Google it and you'll find all sorts of stuff there. Um, the, uh, the low oil price is... It's, one thing to bear in mind is why is it that in the 1990s the break-even point was about $20 a barrel and now it's 70 There's a one-word answer to that and it begins with C. It has three le le syllables and ends in shun. And it's really remarkable how companies like Gazprom pay so much more for things like pipelines and compressors than anyone else. So, I mean, a bit of a squeeze, the first thing to go might be some of these incredible boondoggles that go on in the um, oil and gas business in Russia. It doesn't have to be 70, it doesn't have to be $70 a barrel break, 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 break even. And to some extent, the cost just rise to whatever the, uh, um, to whatever the oil price is. I think there's a, there's a nice Western fiction, which is that the cold blast of economic reality will mean that Russia therefore has to ship up and see sense and will, you know, re try and stoke investor confidence, not do it, not say any more nasty things and so on. And yet, certainly people like Kudrin very much want that, and people like Alexander Lebedev, the former KGB man turned banker, who's mm -hmm. now setting up an opposition um, party, I, I read, is saying let's not, let's not spook our um, investors with all this sort of stuff. I think there's, there's a strong camp on the other side, and Andrei Piontkovsky put it very well when he said the real struggle now in Russia is between global kleptocrats and national kleptocrats. The global kleptocrats are the ones who steal money in order to invest it, invest it abroad and have a, a stake in Russia's integration in the, in the world economy, and the national kleptocrats are more on the sort of Mugabe model of you know, dig it up, sell it, use the money to hold on to power, and we'll see, we'll, we'll see, what, we'll see what comes out of that. Um, on the, um, on the, I, I can't remember when this question came up, but I, I think that in terms of pragmatism, clearly Russia belongs in what one might call the Greater West. Russia's not going to be a long-term strategic partner for China, and it's not going to be a long-term strategic partner for um, you know, Islamic states like Iran. Um, Pionkovsky, just to quote him again for the sake of completeness, said that any alliance between Russia and China would be like an alliance between a rabbit and a Birkenstrecker, with Russia playing the role of the rabbit. And because I think Russia's too weak, even if they succeeded in regaining you know, Ukraine and Belarus, I still think is too weak to be a sort of proper independent power in world politics. Therefore, that means that the, 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 the ball run, runs around the pinball table and has to end up in the greater West. 
But for that to happen, two things have to change. One is one has to get over, at least to some extent, this sort of imperialist reflex, and the other is the authoritarian one, because those kind of disqualify Russia from being in the, the greater West as long as they last. Um, on the moral authority, I, I'm not saying that Russia, you know, can leap into kind of Swiss or Swedish style um, moral authority overnight. That would be preposterous. But I do think it is possible for ex-colonial powers, by the way they behave, to make friends with their former colonies rather than to alienate them. And there was a time in the early 1990s when Russia was really popular. You know, we, Russians were seen as liberators. Yeltsin, when Yeltsin came to Tallinn in the summer of 1990, I think it was the absolute high point of Russian-Estonian relations. And people really felt that it was for your freedom and ours. We are both in alliance against this ghastly sort of center arm of the KGB and the Communist Party and the Kremlin and all, all the rest of it. And I think that, to some extent, has been squandered um, by sometimes just out of insensitivity, sometimes out of, out of malice. But I think it's also there are Russian individuals who have tremendous moral authority. And, you know, you know one used to be able to say, you know, the Czechs have Havel and the Russians have Sakharov. And those are sort of two um, equal sort of people who people in the West would look up to. And we would say, gosh, we wish we had people like that over here. And it's quite hard now looking at the Russian political scene to see people who one sort of wishes one had in one's own politics. Whereas if you look in other East European countries, one can still, one can still see that. Briefly on Chechnya, you asked when you were last there. Oh, not for um, ages. Not for ages. No. Okay. Um, you need a visa to go to Chechnya. You need a visa to go to Russia, you see. Um, more questions around here. Yes, this gentleman. Yeah. Uh, Keep it brief, because we're running over. Yeah, so. Richard Pendry, University of Kent, Department of Journalism and ex frontline news television. Um, why, why are we so interested in all the Russians leaving the North Caucasus? I just didn't understand that. Sorry? Why, why, so, oh, sorry yeah, just, uh, just, why, why was it so interesting for well, you? I just think, I mean, it, it, uh, and to some extent, the, the, there's a process of decolonization going on, that Russians moved to the North Caucasus yeah, as Russia... Imperial Russia moved there. I just think it's quite interesting that although the Kremlin's managed more or less to keep a political grip on the North Caucasus, it, the, the, uh, the, these are now much more ethnically homogenous countries than they or places, republics, whatever you call them, than they've been before. It was just an aside. I don't think it's. And I think for the long term, for Russia's control of the North Caucasus, it's possibly quite ominous. Okay, let, uh, let's take some more questions. Uh, let, uh, yes. Um. Irina Demchenko, RIA Novosti News Agency. Uh, I want to pick up a comment from a gentleman sitting opposite of me uh, about the threat that Russia can attack somebody. I want to ask you, Ed, because you are an expert in this uh, item, uh, how this actually item appeared at all, uh, taking into account Russia's weaknesses, which you stress always, the uh, Russian demography situation, the condition of Russian army, uh, the huge space in Siberia where, I don't know, one person lives on 100 square kilometers, uh, Russian history where Russians actually never except few cases, ideological cases in the Soviet Union with Czechoslovakia and Afghanistan, never attacked anybody except of just trying to, to return their own territories. <laughs> How this actually item about attacking somebody appeared? Okay, uh, a lady with strike, sure. yeah. Hi, yeah, sorry, my name's Sandra, I'm a communications consultant. Just very briefly, we've had eight years of a Bush administration. I just wondered if you could just say how the US-Russian relationship has evolved over the last eight years, since 2001, and whether you see, if there is a new Obama leadership um, in a couple of weeks' time, how the Russian-US relationship will develop in the future. Okay, um, lady at the front. Sorry, I won't forget you, you next. Hi, Sandra Gaskella. Um, ex-graduate or graduate of European Studies, I guess. Um, just a couple of comments quickly. Um, firstly, to to the um, the comment about very briefly. Yes, very quick, quickly. Um, the comment about Russia, if were it stronger, it would um, be be a threat militarily. Um, just to sort of point out, I think democracy in Russia would actually improve were Russia to, to modernize and develop because that would in, attract more FDI from, from foreign countries, which would attract more foreign presence, which would probably 
you know, enhance the democracy and build up of that. So I think Russia modernizing would actually be a good thing rather than, of course, rather than, um, you, you know, um, encourage it to, to somehow That's not attack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, secondly, I think we're speaking on a very fantastical level about about um, sort of military, I don't know, offense, rather than I think the real threat, if, if there is a threat, is, is more in economic terms, which we've mm. touched upon before. Um, and just very quickly, sorry. Um, you got a question? No, as I said at the beginning, it's more of a comment just to someone else can mold it into a question if they want to. Um, Yes, the threat of, of, of economic dependence and, and the EU being economically dependent also runs the other way, of course, because um, the EU is Russia's major trading partner and Russia has its pipelines only going towards the West rather than to China, as someone already said before. So mm. really, the, how big is the threat? Also, by Russia's energy reserves are peaking and by 2020, we'll probably have moved on to Africa. So. Okay, all right, gentlemen over there. Um, hi, my name is Guy Edmonds. Uh, just a quick question. Edward mentioned the um, uh, sort of army of bankers and accountants in London and other financial centres who are responsible for aiding and abetting the kind of Russian kleptocracy. Now that we have politicians like Gordon uh, Brown floating ideas of a reform of Bretton Woods, is this an opportunity to curb that um, opportunity? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, we have more questions in the bar afterwards. Just a few more questions around here, because there, there was a couple of hand, a couple of hands up, and um, I felt I was a bit unfair. This gentleman and that lady there, and then, as Ed says. What's the point of uh, having um, uh, Georgia and Ukraine entering NATO if uh, we, we, what would have been the outcome of the Georgia war if uh, Georgia and Ukraine would have been entering NATO if the Western countries are not really ready to send troops to Riga or Tallinn if they attacked and if the American army completely overstretched? Would it have been just nothing and NATO being ridiculed, not, not being able to defend their member? Okay, and lady down here. Uh, hi, just quickly. Um, do you think that Republicans or Democrats would be better for Russia? And what do you think about the fact that Alaskans are watching Alaska through their kitchen window? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ed. Um, most of those were to you. Let's start with you. We'll try and keep it brief because we're running right, over. Right. I'm going to try and be telegraphy chesky in the answers and um, <laughs> go in reverse order. Um, on America, I think the Bush administration's policy towards Russia has been you could hardly make it, you could hardly have been worse, really. Um, I think you know, the missile defence is pretty ill-conceived, ill probably won't work, very expensive, divides Europe, provokes Russia, um, gives a kind of fake security guarantee to the, the countries involved. Thoroughly bad idea, although if the countries want to do it, they're entitled to. Um, I think on nukes, it's been particularly bad to tear up the ABM treaty and not to start new talks and start three is ridiculous, because whatever we think of the regime in the Kremlin, whether they're modernizers, huggable ex-KGB people, or loathsome thieving, thieving Czechists, they're still the world's second nuclear power, and we have to deal with them. And it doesn't make America any safe, safer if we have this big and growing strategic Im Im imbalance. So I ho hope that whoever um, is elected will, will do something on that. Um, on the interdependent, interdependence point, it's asymmetric. That's the, that's the, you know, the, the problem, that Russia is able to use its trading links in a rather politicized way, whereas the West is not able to use its multiple links in a, um, um, in, in it with, any, with any kind of linkage. Um, on this question about, you know, I, I, I think the Georgia adventure was fairly specific and isn't likely to be replicated um, as a sort of template. I think it's pretty alarming if you are in a country even smaller than Georgia and if you see the Russian military practicing exercises involving the reconquest of your country and you know that NATO has no military plans at all um, to help you in that event. Because we don't know who's going to be in power in the Kremlin in five years' time. It may be someone much nastier than, than, than the current gang. Um, and I think on, the, on the, your question about NATO, um, Remember, no one was saying put Ukraine and Georgia into NATO straight away. The question was whether they should have MAP, the Membership Action Plan, which is an awful lot of action before you get to membership. And it's a pretty demanding process. I watched it happen in the Baltic states. And there's a big question in my mind whether either Ukraine or Georgia would have actually gone through with some of the things that were needed, particularly in terms of civil control 
of the of the military and the arms sales, which would be a big, big, big problem for Ukraine. At the end of that process, there's then a question, is it good for NATO? Does NATO want it? And is it good for that country? And again, in Ukraine, there might well have been a feeling they didn't want to go down that road. But I do think the map process itself is very beneficial. Um, I agree, Article 5 is already stretched perilously thin, and Article 4 even more so. And so I'm not in favour of giving vague security guarantees that can't be enforced. We've seen where that goes. But I am in favour of giving countries clear perspectives about what they need to do in order to get closer to us. Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods. Um, this is a great time to say to the people who run PricewaterhouseCoopers, the people who run the stock exchange, the people who run, sorry guys, you have to ultimately to serve a political system and not the other way around. I think that over the last few years, we were really intimidated by the titans of finance who were able to say, you're just naive and you don't understand. And this is the way the world works. We're going to accept these clients, never mind the smell test. And politicians just backed down. And even when they objected, they didn't object very hard. And I think now is a very good time to say, actually, Western capitalism has some quite tough rules and quite high standards. And there are, and just as we are not allowing you to accumulate trillions of dollars in credit default swaps off the market, we also don't want you um, signing off on the books for companies that are basically stealing machines. And that leaves for you, Alexei, the question of the American elections. Who will be better, <laughs> the Republicans or the Democrats? Well, I, I have no Russia's idea, actually. View. From Russia's on, point of view. On, on, honestly, uh... Well, I suppose Obama might be better, if only because he still has people from, from, from Clinton administration, and there are some contacts, while McCain, who seems to be a sort of man of personal integrity, but still it's completely new people. It's, it's uh, like he's very ideologized, I suppose. He has uh, Saakashvili's ex-public relations uh, expert working uh, for him, so it will it will have the whole. Eventually, it will sort out itself, but it will take just longer times. And now, this time is not particularly good to to have pauses, right? In relationship. And to your question, may I remind that Alaska is a tradition historically is a Russian territory, <laughs> and one day <laughs> we will recover it, NATO or no, no NATO. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And uh, thank you for all your questions. My apologies if we didn't get to all of them. Two guests still here.